So we can go ahead and start. Um, so today I'm very pleased to introduce uh, our speaker, Yuna Kim. Um, Yuna is a condensed matter theorist and professor of physics at Cornell. She specializes in the study of strongly correlated systems and has made a number of uh, gro really groundbreaking contributions in the study of high temperature superconductivity and topological phases. Uh, most recently, she's been thinking about the use of machine learning methods for problems in condensed matter. And we're looking really looking forward to hearing her talk about that today. Um, you know, so please take it away. Thank you, Esmin. <clears throat> Thank you so much for inviting me uh, to give this talk. Um, so I want to talk about uh, harnessing data revolution in quantum matter. Uh, um, specifics of the, the more details of the uh, two works that I want to discuss, you will find in this these two preprints. Um, let's see. Uh, no, I cannot move. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, the whole technology. I, I just uh, recorded my lecture before this because it overlaps with my lecture and I was juggling all. All right. So, um, the uh, the goal condensed matter uh, quantum condensed matter community has is uh, to understand how different microscopic details such as this structure and this structure lead to vastly different properties uh, graphite versus diamond or sometimes uh, certain types of materials have uh, really remarkable properties. We want to understand um, how different uh, Hamiltonians, different uh, uh, materials lead to different properties, and we want to control them. Um, I don't think the community has been necessarily thinking of this as uh, in, in this light that I'm going to present, but I think this is something that if you sort of um, in, in retrospection, it kind of comes to comes to our mind. That is uh, the reason why uh, trying to understand and uh, predict the next high temperature superconductor is challenging, can be brought down to sort of information uh, perspective. So here, here I'm showing you uh, arrangement of atoms involved in a compound called cadmium rhenium oxide. Uh, if you've never heard of it, that's okay. All that matters is that this is a unicell. Unicell is what's repeating in a crystalline material. And you can see that there are a lot of, lot of balls, which means there are a lot of atoms involved. This is a big unicell. Although it is on a big side for a unicell, um, if you have a pristine crystal where uh, all, and if you only look at the location of atoms, the information content of such a crystal is intensive. You just need to know what atoms are involved and what the symmetry group is. And that's very small amount of information. But in reality, um, various uh, the degrees of freedom in the system that are either ordering or fluctuating have to be taken into account. Charge, uh, orbital spin, and also there will be defects in the arrangements of atoms. So when you start to take all of these things into account, information contents become extensive. And then uh, quickly, a small piece of material would have um, information that is exceeding the you know library, the total amount of information in the Library of Congress. So um, the community has not been thinking from this. Okay, this is the amount of information in the material that I might want to understand. But we were instinctively driven to try to gain more and more information out of the systems. So uh, we have been developing a lot of new tools and improving existing tools so that we can gain more information out of the system. And that's what I'm calling data revolution. Over the course of the last couple of decades, uh, the complexity, volume, and novelty of the data that we collect from quantum matter have really exploded. So for instance, if you think about um, quantum computers that are now um, openly accessible to public, uh, <clears throat> these systems realize certain quantum state but uh, by the uh, principle of quantum mechanics, we cannot know the state itself. What we can only do is projective measurement. Each projective me measurement uh, projects the state into what we, we have measured. And we try to figure out what the state system is in by uh, trying to reconstruct from all these projective measurements 
and the space is enormous. <clears throat> Tunneling density of states uh, is measured, it, it was measured in 1960s through these kind of macroscopic tunnel junction in a sandwich. So you have uh, two, uh, in this case, superconducting material, and you will put an insulator in the middle. And in order to study the property of the superconductor, we will apply a voltage, and we measure the tunnel conductance as a function of voltage. And this plot that is very well known to uh, condensed matter uh, community, because this is really a, a paradigmatic plot that you know wildly speaks that BCS speaks the BCS superconductivity. We understand the uh, suppression of this uh, quantity, the density of state. We understand the peak, but moreover, we also understand these um, subtle, subtler features. So um, then we go forward in time and arrive at year 2000. Instead of having one single microscopy tunnel junction, we have many, many, many uh, atomic scale junctions and uh, the, the barrier is provided for by the vacuum. And now instead of a single curve, uh, we're going to have many, many, many curves as we move around the system and take the measurement at each position. This is so-called scanning mode. Many different types of probes uh, that used to be a bulk probe giving us one number have gone to a scanning mode. And um, scanning tunneling microscopy is just one example of it. And if we open up a textbook, um, I am from Cornell. Uh, I'm at Cornell, and you know, we love our Ashcroft and Berman, but Ashcroft and Berman does not tell us how to think about data like this. X ray diffraction um, in 1913, in this Nobel Prize winning paper of father and son Bragg and Bragg, they made a splash by uh, producing the first uh, successful forward model. They did the measurement of X-ray uh, diffraction measurement or reflection measurement, and they rotated the piece of crystal, and they found three peaks, and they found the location of these peaks seemed to change as they changed the material. And they uh, postulated a model to forward model this phenomena. The model was that, okay, my atoms are forming a lattice, and um, if my incident angle and uh, reflection angle is such that I'm getting a peak, that should tell me about the distance between the atomic planes. This is an example of a forward modeling. In all forward modeling, we um, guess what kind of arrangements of scatters or atoms that uh, are in real space and produce what uh, scattering intensity they should they would amount to and try to match that scattering intensity with the data by changing the parameters of the model. When you have just three peaks, this is uh, simple enough that we teach this in high school physics. But uh, when you have many, many more peaks, like we do today, uh, it's no longer a simple uh, matter. So let's see, here is a video of um, this little hexagons are what's called brillant zones. Those are units in momentum space. This is showing that the, uh, the comprehensive measurements that are now possible, the uh, number of frames uh, that they can take while they are rotating the sample this is the uh, the top of the line uh, cutting edge X-ray experiment facility setup, and now uh, the the question is, uh, when you have ten thousand peaks instead of three peaks, and when you have a large unit cell, and when you want when when you know because I have been able to extract larger amount of information from the system, there is a lot more I can learn from it. Um, but this is beyond the scope of what Bragg and Bragg had or evolution of it. How do we approach this problem? So these are examples of uh, data revolution, data-driven problems. And um, those of us who have been uh, thinking about applying machine learning uh, for uh, physics data, we, we understand that you know it's a data science tool, so it depends. You have to know the structure of your data, and you have to ask the questions that are meaningful in your data. So in my group, we've been trying to uh, form the bridge between 
um, complex and rich and novel experimental data and theoretical understanding by using uh, data science tools, machine learning tools. Um, the efforts have started um, couple, just a couple of years ago. First paper that really uh, took real experimental data seriously in the, in the quantum matter and showed that you can use this very primitive, simple um, neural network to nevertheless achieve uh, more objective testing of different theoretical hypotheses we have about data was this paper. Um, since this paper, we have been expanding uh, our uh, uh, investigations into many different types of data, including uh, data from IBM Q uh, machines, um, spectroscopic data that's measuring various resonances, resonant ultrasound spectroscopy, and we also look at synthetic data that we generate from simulations. Um, what I want to focus on today are um, XTEC, which is X-ray temperature series clustering, a uh, tool that we have developed where we're using uh, unsupervised uh, but still very simple clustering approach to discover trends in the data, large volume data. Um, and I also want to talk about um, our recent work on co correlation convolutional neural networks, CCNN, developed for image-like data. So um, for XTEC, this is going to be um, unsupervised and uh, sort of more generated modeling perspective, uh, probabilistic modeling perspective. For quantum gas microscopy, this is going to be a, a supervised uh, learning using a new type of architecture, which is designed to be interpretive, in interpretable. The way I look at machine learning, less as somebody who's trying to um, come up with a new tool, but more as uh, sort of a consumer of tools that I might hack it often. Uh, but what we have repeatedly found important in my group is that it's important to know what your objective is. So uh, here is a really wonderful tool, uh, uh, commercial grade blender. If your objective is to make a nice smoothie uh, crushing ice, this would be a good tool for you. But if your objective is to make, make uh, a good guacamole, uh, you don't want to crush it all. You want to be able to see different ingredients and how they come together. And um, this more uh, stone age looking tool can be a better tool for you if that's what your objective. And generally, the idea is that uh, this minimalistic approaches that um, integrates key physics principles and allows us to touch back, touch back on uh, phys interpretations within the language of physics, the language that our colleagues who are not uh, exposed to machine learning can understand. Uh, I think it's really important for uh, our contributions to be uh, making, you know, contributing to the, the progress in science. So um, the XTEC, unsupervised machine learning tool for high volume X-ray diffraction, XRD is X-ray diffraction data. By the way, um, please interrupt me at any time and, you know, ask questions. I am guessing the audience is broad and I don't want to talk over your head. Uh, so just please interrupt me at any time and, uh, you know, uh, just say out questions. I don't want to speak. Um, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't want to be speaking in a foreign language. Um, so this work was really driven by my um, excellent uh, students, Jordan Vendeli and Mike Meddy. And we had great fun working together with uh, colleagues from computer science department and um, X-ray experimentalists at uh, Cornell High Energy Synchrotron Source and Argonne National Lab. Another thing I've learned uh, trying to work with real data is that uh, you know I cannot start anything until I have data, and um, getting access to meaningful data is a, a big a big step. So it was really wonderful to be able to work with my colleagues as synchrotron sources who were interested in um, helping us develop the tool, ask the meaningful questions so that we can implement these tools in the, in the facilities. 
So let me start with the questions that we're going to be interested in uh, that one can uh, ask of X-ray diffraction. Um, X-ray uh, photon scatters off of charged particles. So in, uh, in an atom, the charged particles are ions and electrons. So uh, in this case, if I have um, atoms uh, or ions uh, that are forming this kind of lattice, I am depicting a one-dimensional lattice for simplicity. Without any distortion, I have uh, two sites per unit cell. So that is uh, so this orange blob orange ball and green ball. These are two sites in a unit cell. Unit cell is what's repeating. This is, re is repeating. And the uh, uh, periodicity in space for that repetition is a lattice constant A. So um, what the, the X-ray diffraction pattern, which is Fourier transform, essentially Fourier transform of the density, is going to show you is peaks at integer Bragg positions to pi over a, but the peak heights are going to be different between different uh, Bragg positions because of the form factor reflecting this internal structure inside the unit cell. Now, if I change the unit cell size, here now unit cell size has doubled. Now this is my unit cell as opposed to this. Um, the doubling of unit cell here occurred because of the distortion. This, the atom that used to be here has been distorted this way, this atom distorted that, that way, sort of um, alternatingly. And as a result, I have enlarged unit cell. And the fact that I have enlarged unit cell will be reflected in the X-ray data through um, new additional super lattice peaks. Uh, now, this super lattice peaks at half integer positions have uh, different heights as you go out to different Brillouin zones, because that's telling me about the uh, uh, internal structure. Another type of ordering that charged uh, X-ray can detect is this sort, this kind of dif uh, distortion that's not changing the size of the unit cell. So unit cell is still um, separated by one lattice constant, but now the arrangement of the atoms inside the unit cell have changed. And this is what we call intra-unicell order. Uh, nematic is a very prominent intra-unicell order type that there is a lot of interest in. And, but these type of orders do not introduce new super lattice peaks. Notice all the peaks are still in the integer positions. Only difference between this X-ray data and this X-ray data, uh, simulated data, is that compared to this one, which have the same height uh, on every other Brillouin zone, this one has the uh, peak positions um, changing, showing the uh, form factor effect. So these are much subtler things to detect. Uh, and when the distortions are small, it can be very uh, challenging to detect these kind of distortions. So now uh, when I have access to is just the intensities. So that's the um, inverse problem associated with all sorts of scattering um, types of probe. We always measure intensity, we don't measure phase. So you, you have these intensities distributions, you have these peaks, and now instead of three peaks Bragg and Bragg had, I have 100,000 peaks. And I want to look for maybe new peak that's showing up. I want to look for different zone-to-zone -zone correlation that reveals form factor information. And how do I deal with this when I have um, terabytes of data coming out of machine? Um, the approach at the moment that researchers take is that they take this data, spending a couple of days at the synchrotron source, and then they bring it home or they leave it at the site and they log it, log into the site. Um, and then they look at different cuts because human eyes cannot comprehend distribution of intensities in 3D. We can comprehend shape, but this is distribution and it's we cannot comprehend. It, we cannot process it. So we have to look at, if, we, if, it, if it requires human inspection, we have to look at different slices. So people take different slices and look at it, but there is a choice. And if your slice didn't ha happen to capture 
the the uh, the wave vector positions where something interesting is happening, you're going to miss it. And inspecting every single pick manually uh, by human inspection is too time consuming and graduate student time is expensive. So we take this kind of data because we've invested in the facility, but then uh, we end up uh, not looking most of the data and just looking at some small handpicked parts of it. So now the question is, how do we search through this data in a sort of um, intelligent way and efficient way? Now, I am a mother of uh, two little kids, and I face different sort of problem of having too much of something in this pandemic era parenting, and that is having too much of Lego. And many parents have love-hate relationship with Lego. Um, we step on it too much, but um, this, this is a task that I was asked to do when I'm not doing physics. I was asked to find the specific piece they need, and I have this pile of uh, Lego set, and the first thing, you know, it, it took just a couple of days of trying to do this to figure out uh, picking up one piece and inspecting it by eye is really not a good idea. We cannot pay attention. We get tired. We bl uh, blindly miss the, the piece that's right in front of us. So quickly we developed the approach of, okay, let's first sort. Um, if what I am asked to find is a special yellow piece, I will first sort by color. And then I just need to inspect the yellow yellow bin. Maybe I will further sort inside the yellow bin by shape, right? So uh, with Lego, we've quickly developed this kind of sorting strategy. Now coming back to my X-ray problem, question is my data does not have color or shape, and I want to develop a tool that can be applied uh, in uh, in a very diverse setting, flexible and diverse. So uh, if you don't know the sorting criteria, we had to kind of think about what would make a difference for us for the X-ray data, which is free, free transform of uh, charge distribution. Now, um, often measurements are done with some control parameter. Uh, sample is there and you scatter while you're rotating the sample, but you also change something else. There is a control parameter. It could be pressure, could be uh, doping, um, it could be some uh, some other type of control, um, but typically there is a control parameter. And temperature is the most common control parameter because that is really uh, what tells us the difference between what Hamiltonian wants and what the entropy will do. So the innate property of the system, the interactions determine what is the energy that a given configuration of my charge would have. And then there is an entropy driving the randomness and temperature is what's setting the balance between the two. So if we want to be able to sort out different points in reciprocal space, we realize maybe we want to look at how the intensity evolves as a function of temperature. It's a very simple idea. Let's look at the temperature series and uh, sort the uh, different reciprocal space points as if it's a population of Q. Now, this is one of sort of very, very basic equations that you learn in thermodynamics, uh, Helmholtz free energy. We learn this because it's you know, so widely applicable. So when we are after something that's widely applicable, starting from something really basic seems to be a good idea. So what are we envisioning? So this is an example of how the uh, uh, scattering intensities evolve if you know which plane to look at. Uh, at uh, 100 Kelvin, 191 Kelvin, heating up, and this the material is titanium diselenide. It's a material that is known to be a uh, charge density wave material. So this is the data set that we burned to develop the tool, because we know what is going on in this material very well. What it's showing is there are these uh, super lattice peaks that disappear above certain temperature. So now if I treat different points in the reciprocal space, if I have a grid over you know, a range over here, I have actually a grid over the entire range. If I trick, uh, track the intensity at this you know, peak location and all the other locations and plot them all together, just if I track the intensity evolution as a function of temperature and plot them all together, there should be some difference between the locations where that's lighting up or losing as I heat up and the rest that's not showing any sort of systematic trend. So we plot it and the plot looks like this. 
the noise is has big scale in in this data set uh the uh near the uh black peak the the the, the scale the the spec the, the dynamic range dynamic range of the intensity is enormous between um well over 10,000 compared to um you know much smaller and not all high intensity is signal and not all low intensity is noise so we first developed a sort of a uh, principled approach to a uh, threshold and based on um, how how much variation there is in intensity as a function of temperature and when the variation is very tight that is not much temperature dependence we kind of set them aside and we only look at the range where there is some range of temperature dependence. And this is still looking pretty noisy. But what that accomplished is from the whole grid over the reciprocal space, we've reduced the rate, the, the population that we have to track to be just these uh, smaller uh, uh, subset of the population, making use of the fact that uh, reciprocal space is very sparse. And then now we want to do the clustering on this data without pre-imposing any model um, in any detail. So we want to discover uh, different temperature dependent trends in the data, but uh, without being putting in the bias. Could you the, just, the, sorry, could you, yes. could you go back and explain mm -hmm. how you come down to that H and K figure and what those mean? Oh, okay. So um, H, this H from left to right. Is that right? Is that the question? Yeah. So, so the left hand side is a recording of the intensities from scattering as a function of, uh, of momentum transfer. Uh, that is incoming beam, outgoing beam. There, the difference is the momentum transfer. So you take the momentum transfer, and uh, this is looking at, so we have three-dimensional momentum transfer, Q, uh, Q, X, Q, Y, Q, Z. Uh, so data is distributed in the three-dimensional space. And here we are looking at a plane. We call X, Y, Z, uh, H, K, L. It's just a convention. So Q, H means X component. Q, K means Y component. So we are looking at, X, Y plane of a three-dimensional distribution of data. Okay. Yeah, um, thank you. Now, the distribution of data is like everywhere, but uh, because the because the there is a regularity in the in the real system, you only hit the atoms in a regular angles. As a result, most of the data, most of the space, the reciprocal space, is not really um, interesting. So actions are happening either at the points that are associated with the lattice, uh, inverse of the lattice, that's two pi over A, uh, or some new periodicity that shows up from this density wave formation. So this process, this thresholding process using KL divergence was a way of reduce, move, separating out where something is, act any action is happening from what seems to be really uh, background. And this was required, necessary, because uh, although the tool that we're using, which I'm about to go into, is Gaussian mixture model, which is really simple, but even running Gaussian mixture model on eight terabytes was really pushing it. So we, we would um, pare it down like this. Okay. Could you uh, say again mm -hmm. how what the threshold and rescale was? I, I missed that part. Right, right, right. So the thresholding, what, what we did for thresholding was um, um, for each each uh, each reciprocal space point, <clears throat> we have a whole temperature dependence. So we have a temperature series per Q. We look at the mean of that uh, that temperature dependence. And the mean of the temperature dependence often showed a distribution. Um, the intensity mean was showing a distribution. And um, when there is, and, and we only kept the, and most of it 
was if we have this whole distribution, most of it reflected sort of the noise because larger population is actually really noise. So we we uh, modeled that distribution of average over I of IQ of T over T and only kept sort of the tail of it, removing the larger population because making use of the sparsity and trying to look at uh, the intensities that are um, showing more, uh, show, showing the variation such that it's away from the overall larger population. But the details of this scheme is in the supplementary of the paper. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for great questions. All right. So, um, and then what we decided to do was uh, to treat this um, clustering problem sort of like a speaker verification problem, although speaker verification today is much more involved. Early stage speaker verification with uh, one of the approaches was Gaussian mixture model. So we initially started this, uh, in this uh, effort trying to use GP, Gaussian processes, but uh, it was just too expensive with, for our volume of data. And so we became then less greedy and um, kept things really simple and went with Gaussian mixture model. So the Gaussian mixture model is after pre-processing and just reducing the volume of the data to what's showing more, more of variation over temperature. Uh, so I have uh, the whole series uh, or um, DT, the number of temperature points that we measure, dimensional vectors associated with each Q point in my three-dimensional space. And then uh, we are uh, modeling that data to be coming from a multivariate normal distribution. So the multivariate normal distribution for a given cluster would be uh, specified by the mean and the variance. So the normal distribution of uh, finding the prob uh, conditional probability of my data for given that mean and the variance will be uh, this formula. And then the log likelihood, if I allow mixing between different uh, Gaussians, the, the normal distributions with the mixing weight pi of k will be this. Uh, and then we use expectation maximization algorithm to find the hyperparameters pi the, the mixing weight, uh, mean, and the variance. And once we have the mixing weight, mean, and the variance, we have the cluster assignment. So I emphasize the uh, interpretation. The interpretation in this approach comes by simply just looking. What we get out is the mean and the variance and, and the number of clusters and the cluster assignments. And then we just look at where they came from. So I will demonstrate that using a data set from uh, this paracloracademy renate. So this material uh, is known to be the first uh, paraclor superconductor. Paraclor is this structure that's shown here. Um, and this material goes through several phase transitions. This transition with the singularity in the specific heat is a continuous transition. And therefore, there must be a symmetry lowering um, happening here in this second order transition. The phase one, the highest temperature phase, its structure is well understood. But, uh, and the superconductivity occurs way down here. Uh, now, we would like to understand what's happening in this lower temperature phase. And there is possibly a first order transition here because out of these phases is the superconductor that's emerging. In 2017, a group at Caltech using a technique called a second harmonic generation, an optical technique using light, said uh, the uh, conventional wisdom about this transition involving uh, the st structure that people have been suspecting may not be right, and there may be actually a primary order parameter that's not what was known at the time. So uh, the experimentalists at Argonne decided to look at this material in a very comprehensive way, really making sure that you don't miss anything. So what is in what is in the race between for this transition? 
what's in the race are two candidates of order parameter because we have two candidate phase description for the symmetry of this phase. Uh, one order parameter is a two-dimensional order parameter. Uh, it's called EU. Another order parameter is a one-dimensional order parameter. And uh, this, uh, which one of these is describing this transition is question that's being debated. Uh, so we take this data, um, 15,000 Brillouin zones, eight terabytes, and we ran the clustering. Um, and uh, one parameter that we set in running the algorithm is just the number of clusters. So we, we tell the algorithm, let's try two clusters. And this is the result it spits out. The, this result is the mean, mean uh, temperature series and the variance of the temperature series for two clusters. And it's very simple, very clean looking. And this looks very tantalizingly order parameter looking for a continuous transition right at the right temperature. None of this information was given. Now, in order to interpret this res uh, a clustering result and to decide whether this makes sense to us, what we do is look at where they came from. And you find that like this looks very much like drawn by hand, but this is really the data. Uh, these spots where the purple's coming from, those are still integer uh, HKL points, which means these are lattice uh, uh, frag peaks. No, this is uh, intra unit cell order in my uh, classification earlier. These are lattice frag peaks, but the frag peaks that were not allowed by symmetry at high symmetry phase. So location of these new Bragg peaks that are now allowed in the lower symmetry phase tell us which type of structure the system can be in. That reduces us down to one of these two uh, uh, symmetries uh, point groups, I4 bar M2 and I4 bar. Uh, these are just names for these point groups. Um, now, this looks rather simple for the, 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 the volume of data that I was talking about. The reason why it's looking very simple is because we kind of forced the entire group of uh, intensities near Bragg peaks to be uh, one group behaving together. So when we release that so that we can look at more of a detail, uh, we tried different clustering and we find like two cluster was not so the reason the way we decide how what's the natural cluster because we are just trying to discover what's going on in the data the way to discover what is the natural cluster is to change the number of number of clusters that we use at the moment this is kind of manual and ad hoc but uh we try changing the number of clusters and see whether the results change in a meaningful way for instance if we ask for too many clusters when naturally the data has i don't know three or four let's say the data has four and we ask for eight clusters. What we will get back are different clusters that are really nearly on top of each other. So we'll, we'll find out, okay, that was too many. So for when we opened up each vicinity of the peak, we found that there are four distinct clusters. And then uh, you can see where those four clusters are coming from by looking at the blow up of the regions of each peak. Now, this does not look like much um, for, it, it didn't look like much to me. It didn't look like much, doesn't look like much for anybody who does not have much, uh, have, uh, I was not an x-ray expert. And so I'm not an x-ray expert. I reported back to my x-ray colleagues that, look, we're getting these clusters and the center of the peak, this is a bright peak, center of the peak and the halo of the peak are being clustered differently. And they were like really, uh, First, they were really puzzled because they never thought about it that way. They've never thought the halo of the peak can be any different from the center of the peak. It's just the, the vicinity. How can it be any different? Uh, but we said, no, but the temperature dependence is different. The center of the peak, so actually the tr transition occurs at 200 Kelvin, it's out here. After the transition at which the center of the peak goes way up, after that, it just stays kind of uh, not changing much. Well, inside the phase, it doesn't change much, but there is a region around it, the halo, which shows enhanced intensity. This red halo shows enhanced intensity 
in what I call phase two, all the way here, though unfortunately I haven't plotted. And then it drops down at the lower temperature phase. And then this blue halo shows very little activity in that phase two, but it picks up as we enter phase three. And there was a clear pattern in where we see red halo and where we see blue halo and all the black centers of the peak were the same. And this puzzled us. So uh, analysis was completed in like 15 minutes. And then for two months, we were stuck trying to understand what to make of this. And then we realized uh, that, first of all, this is just, it's what's in the data. We just make the line cut and you see literally, this is the, uh, the diffraction region, uh, the diffuse region that's called fluctuation region. And what we realized is that this diffuse region is, is uh, consistent with what a uh, Goldstone mode associated with this two-dimensional order parameter would do. So this ordering into the two-dimensional order parameter phase was like ordering in an XY model. There was a little bit of an isotropy, but like in an XY model, you order, uh, you still have a Goldstone mode. And that fluctuation is allowed only in that phase and where we see the fluctuation gave us the information of which atoms are moving in which way. This uh, selection rule associated with where we see the fluctuation allowed us to infer that, okay, cadmium and rhenium atoms are moving in out of phase manner. And that's what's giving this uh, fluctuation. And this level of information was something that was not uh, accessible. Although it's in the data, people didn't know how to look at it. So that's, this was really exciting. Um, another uh, another uh, direction. So the, this first direction is kind of looking at probabilistic modeling to sort the data in an efficient way. The second direction is looking at um, how we do the hypothesis testing. Often we look at data and uh, uh, experimentalists design experiments in order to test hypothesis. They want to test, is this theory right? Is that theory right? Is this thing that's predicted in this theory actually happening in the data? That's how the experiments are designed. So you do the experiment and you look at your data and ask, is the data looking like any of your co colleagues' predictions? You know, colleagues at Berkeley, colleagues at Harvard or Cornell. And the reality is never the data looks exactly like what anybody predicted. So we are, we are left with the task of trying to infer from the data which hypothesis best describe the data. So this is very uh, is particularly challenging with image like data, and this that's what we were tackling here. The, the image here is coming from the quantum simulation of Fermi Hubbard model, a uh, prototypical strongly correlated model, which is uh, supposed to be a way to think about uh, high, TG, high TC superconductor phase diagram. The experiments um, using um, ultra cold atoms have really come to a ripe age now. They can actually see uh, antiferromagnetic uh, tendencies. They can see uh, strange metal behavior. They can see a lot of things that are happening up here. Now, um, these systems, quantum simulators, like IBM quantum computer, these things are all measured through a projective measurement. So you make a snapshot, which is just a projective measurement. So you have a bunch of snapshots and we're trying to infer what these snapshots mean. And often we want to see whether uh, hypothesis A or hypothesis B better describe the data. And in this kind of a uh, challenging um, area of uh, underdog regime away from antiferromagnetic order, different types of uh, hypothesis of what would happen if you try to dope antiferromagnet this is what's called geometric string picture, where uh, when you when a hole moves, it leaves behind a wake of wrong bonds. The right bonds are opposite color, but these are wrong bonds. So, so this is leaving a whole host of wrong bonds, and this is kind of what's called frozen spin approximation. And then there is a pi flux theory, which starts from various singlets being in superposition. These are, uh, from a theory standpoint, very different theories. But the images they produce, if we try to make up an image associated with that hypothesis, they are not that different. So that's the challenge. 
a conventional approach. Conventionally, when you have a magnetic system, you study it by looking at the magnetization. You can look at the spin-spin correlation. You can look at the uh, um, nail order parameter that is uh, alternating magnetic alternating spin. But these approaches do not yield meaningful differences between these theories, which are coming from very different starting points. So there are two possible possibilities. A, the two hypotheses that are seemingly different are not actually very different. That's one possibility. Or we just didn't know what to look at to find the difference. So um, when you have this kind of complex image problem, we all know that uh, using uh, supervised learning with a label data can be a very helpful way to look at it. But the problem with using uh, wild, widely available off-the-shelf CNN is that they are very over-parameterized and they're black boxes and physicists hate black boxes. Um, so what my student Cole realized is that, you know, convolution is a good idea because we can learn motifs that are important but then the typical nonlinear step make it totally impossible for us to know what the filter actually meant in the data. So instead of doing the typical nonlinear step, how about we do sort of a controlled nonlinear steps? So he said, like, let's look at you know, first order, second order, just you know, polynomials and see what orders do we have to go and which of these are meaningful. Because a uh, higher order polynomial means uh, making a correlation out of the pixels in the data. So we can take the higher order into the notion of correlation. So second, first order is looking at one pixel at a time. Second order looks at two pixels. Third order looks at three pixels at a time. So the, the architecture that uh, Cole uh, proposed is uh, what we dub correlation CNN, CCNN. So we take the snapshots uh, in three channels, spin up, spin down, and hold, and we convolve it with the filters, which we will learn. Um, and then we construct different uh, order of correlations, Cs of Ns. And then out of those correlator estimate, we uh, go through the uh, uh, back end of the architecture, fully connected uh, step. And the uh, uh, uh challenging part is how to build this correlation but um uh cole came up with this idea that oh actually i can build this higher order correlations sort of by cascading um it's it's been really remarkable working with him um he started working with me as a first year graduate student and he would find problems and the next day he will solve it you know one day he would say oh i have this problem next day he, he would say oh i solved it so this was one of those things. Um, he will come up with an idea, get stuck, and then he will solve it himself. Um, and then to figure out which of the correlations were actually important, all we did was uh, regularization path analysis. So after training, because we wanted to learn what the neural network learned so that uh, we can figure out whether these uh, data have actually meaningful differences with, that we didn't know how to look at and what they are. Uh, we would hold the uh, uh, architecture fixed, and then we would just retrain by uh, changing the uh, the loss. And this is uh, for the two fixed filters in three channels. Um, what we found after doing the regularization path analysis, trying to distinguish two hypotheses in this case called um, geometric string and pi flux. And uh, uh, this regularization path analysis shows that fourth order correlators were important. And it was just something nobody thought about. You know, we are used to looking at uh, order parameter. We are used to looking at um, two, uh, p two pairwise correlations. We never thought about fourth order correlator. But turned out the fourth order correlator was what's important in distinguishing these two patterns. Now, to, uh, see how how this is all working. It's really helpful to see um, how the whole CCNN combined with regularization path analysis works for something simpler. Fluctuating antiferromagnet versus random um, image. So left hand side is fluctuating antiferromagnet, right hand side is a random image. 
when we uh, train with these label data set, we find two filters for spin up and spin down. Obviously, this uh, sec at, at a C2 level, when the two pixels are always thought together, this will lead to antiferromagnetic pattern. And when we uh, let the CCNN run and, and do the regularization path analysis, we indeed find the second order correlator to give like 100% accuracy. So using the same kind of approach, uh, we've learned that uh, for this filter, the fact that the fourth order correlator is important tell us which motifs the network picked up using this filter. The motif the network picks up using this filter will be four pixel motifs. And given this filter, we can figure out what those four pixel motifs with high intensities are. And now we can look at, um, does that make sense to us? And if you look at all the uh, uh, all the four pixels for C4 that you make out, we make out of this uh, filter, we see that indeed we one will find this kind of pattern: one hole neighboring two uh, up spin and one down spin um, in in the vicinity of a hole if it is in the geometric string arrangement, and um, this will be what you see in this wake of the wrong bonds. So we can see it learned, CCNN learned what makes sense to us. So we would trust what it would say because it learned what, what would make sense to us. For a pi flux, it learned what seems to be a variation on sort of a fluctuation around antiferromagnetic order. Another thing we were able to do by having CCNN was that when we applied this to the experimental data, we, we found that uh, the uh, CCNN focuses on a uh, small difference between experimental data and uh, simulated data uh, that was not what one would have thought important. So the small uh, lack, lack of a small piece of information in the experimental data, small uncertainty, made it uh, not possible to transfer the network tra trained on a simulated da data to the real data which is often the mode that people operate in because training data of real uh, system, real data is, is not available. So we often work with simulated data, but if we work with black box, we don't know what happens when we try to give that network to the real data, what small uh, um, unimportant difference that it would be hanging on to. So to summarize, I've talked about um, uh, different um, efforts at uh, trying to deal with data-driven problems in uh, quantum matter systems. And um, some of those problems are kind of a, um, are, are sort of an inverse problem that we don't know the phase and we want to be able to go back to the real space. And some of them are pattern recognition problems trying to find the motifs. And um, for different types of problems, we are we've been trying to develop um, approaches that are based on sort of probabilistic modeling or um, uh, sort of a simple clustering kind of approach or uh, interpretable um, uh, neural network based pattern recognition approaches. And um, I cannot say either of these are the best method, but I wouldn't even attempt to prove it. Uh, or, uh, but I don't think that's a meaningful question. The question is like we want because there is very little available at the moment. We want to really um, improve the status of uh, being able to make use of the data that we are getting better. Um, and we're learning a lot along the way. Um, but I, I think like what we have been able to do are actually very quite exciting. And I can, I think it'll be a very meaningful, uh, different, it will make a meaningful difference to the researchers. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Uh, actually, I couldn't understand what it meant when you have a plot with beta value and oh. C1 to C4 value things. Oh, OK. Could you okay, clarify okay. a bit more about that? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, we have 
C1234, those are, um, C1 is the regular convolution. C2 is a square of that. C, C of n is nth power that are obtained by cascading. But each of those were collected, averaged into um, four different, uh, it, you know, and if I, if, if I have n, C to the n, I would have n different numbers uh, that are going through the uh, uh, logistic regression. So beta, beta 1, beta 2, beta n is associated with C1, C2, Cn. So when the weight of beta for a particular C is small, it means that particular C of I. So if beta I does not turn on, it means C of I was not important. All right, so on the upper right figure, the X axis, mm -hmm. the, the apple. So that yeah, like yes. as learning proceeds, the coefficient is changing. Right, right. All so, right, right. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you for clarification. Sure. Can you say what your uh, training process is here? You're repeatedly, uh, yeah, what are you doing repeatedly and what's the path analysis? Right, so uh, what's being done repeatedly is um, as the lambda that's penalizing, so when lambda is very big uh, over here, when lambda is very, very big, you don't want to have any betas. So all betas will be turned off. So you start from there and with all the betas turned off, you're actually not learning anything. So accuracy is low, it's just random guess, 50%. And as we turn down lambda, which allows some of the betas to be turned on, the first beta to turn on will be what would give you the most gain in correct learning, right? So by looking at which beta turns on first, as we uh, scale down lambda, we find out which Cs uh, were important because that C that was uh, coupled to that beta would have been important for that decision-making. So we look at uh, how the beta coefficients that's learned in this uh, retraining part change and simultaneously observe how the accuracy improve. So the fact that this particular, this is beta four turned on for uh, that filter um, tells us that um, fourth order correlator was meaningful for making the uh, classification. Um, and we see that the accuracy shows a very uh, steep jump when that correlator was allowed, the weight for that correlator was allowed. And then this is the fourth order correlator for the other filter. When that gets turned on, um, there is another big jump in the accuracy. So by looking at this uh, regularization path through this retraining process, uh, when the filter has already now been fixed, with the given fixed filter, by uh, retraining, uh, by uh, in general starting off with penalizing having any weight at all in my input data, we can learn which piece of the input gives real boost in the correct classification. That, that's this regularization path analysis. Um, and, and that's, this is like, uh, like lasso, this is something that's done. But uh, what was new in our paper was that uh, the inputs that were coupled to the beta were the specific C of Ns so that it had a very specific and precisely, easily, uh, straightforwardly interpretable meaning in terms of the motifs that we are looking for. Thank you. Are there other questions? Uh, may I ask a question? Sure. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, first, uh, thanks for the very interesting, very nice talk. So I have a probably quite a naive question about the projective measurement. What does that mm -hmm. mean? Do you mean you have a sort of a, 
a set of bases and you project your wave function to that basis and then you get your yes. data? Yes, yes. Uh, is that a use? Right. So, I so, see, so, yeah. uh, so let me, the contrast is um, traditional measurement. Uh, traditional measurement uh, we assume is, is in equilibrium is ensemble average, um, thermal ensemble average. That's what we uh, traditionally measure. So if you try to model it in calculation, you will model it by, let's say, figuring out the partition function and, and taking the you know, derivative of the partition function because that's doing giving the right weight of the Boltzmann weight and averaging over all possibilities. That's the ensemble average measurement. Uh, the type of measurements that are done with the quantum systems and quantum simulators because these are uh, small isolated quantum systems are really, you have, a, you have a state and you make a measurement. When you make the measurement, you're projecting to that basis. So if I have a spin and I make a sigma Z measurement, I will find whether it's up or down. I will not find anything else. And the moment I measure spin to be up, the state of the system has been projected to sigma z equals to up state. Like in, um, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, that uh, the spin measurement, the, the old measurement, uh, the, uh, the early early days measurement. Uh, so the, the contrast is whether we're looking at uh, thermal uh, ensemble average versus uh, repeated projective measurement. So each time you you have a, you prepare a state, you make one measurement. You will find either up or down if it is sigma z for each of the spins. If I have a you know five qubit system and I make sigma z measurements on all of those qubits, I would get one zero one zero one zero. Um, but if I prepared the state and if it was a many spin state, it would have had different amplitudes for various different states. But when I make the measurement, I just get one of them. So to find out those amplitudes, which tell me what the state the system was in, what I have to do is to prepare the exact same state again and repeat the measurement. And this time, because of the probability, I might get a different outcome. And if I do it enough, I will discover that probability distribution associated with the with the coefficients, the weights of different states in my uh, in my wave function. Does that does that help? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. That uh, I think that explains. So the related question is: uh, so if you are dealing with a many body system, do you have mm -hmm. a, what's the how many are uh, how many are such bases there? Do you have two to the power of n? If you use the bases yes. spin up spin down. Yes, yes. That's why it's enormous. And uh, so in practice, you use this and do this many projections or use there are some kind of smart bases you don't have to do such many. So if you want to, if you want to know, if you want to really reconstruct the state, you will need lots of measurements, exactly. Okay. So there is a whole question of uh, what can I do without so many measurements and um, gain nevertheless meaningful information out about my state of the system. And that's that's a big, big question. Like can uh, some generated modeling based on uh, machine learning architectures can give us more efficient way of understand, figuring out the state with uh, fewer measurements than exponentially many measurements. Uh, this is one of the one of the uh, questions that people are very much interested in. Okay, thanks a lot. Maybe as one last question for me, could you say a little bit, especially about this last um, paper you discussed about like, uh, mm -hmm. I guess, how long it took or, or steps you had to take really to get to, to kind of get to the fixed point the solution that you actually came up with, uh, like how many mm. other maybe Architectures wrong directions, yeah, yeah, or yeah, yeah, to, yeah, yeah, to eventually settle on yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, 
So um, what we first started with was uh, we started with um, we started with just with, with uh, sort of a regular CNN, um, just some you know uh, initially there was a paper where uh, the authors used uh, TensorFlow to write uh, uh, some some deep neural network with lots of parameters. I forgot exactly how many. Uh, what the what the details was, but it wasn't you know anything special, um, and so we started with sort of a very um, off the shelf architecture and doing the regularization path analysis on it. Um, so what once we did the regularization path analysis, we could figure out um, which uh, which fe features mattered, which filters mattered, because the CNN had lots of filters. And uh, we could figure out which filters mattered, but we couldn't figure out why that filter mattered for a given state, because the filter still goes through a nonlinear step, and it was just too hard to figure out what that meant. It just didn't give us any intuitive feeling, uh, and um, we didn't know how to go from there to let's say to see whether this is something that's robust. Or this is something that we got this filter just in this run, right? So each time you train, you will learn something different. And without knowing what to make of these filters, it was really difficult to make progress. So um, and that and that that's where we were in the summer, like early part of the summer. And and then uh, and and I I said uh, to Cole like, but you know you have these filters and we know what one might be looking for. I mean, it must be possible to figure out some way to gain insight. And um, he initially said, no, there is no way because it's all nonlinear. And then after a while, he came back with this architecture. He said, OK, well, if you want to make sense out of it, we cannot have just uh, uh, you know, the uh, standard nonlinear function. Like, you, know, you cannot do ReLU because I don't know what to make of it, but we can do this, and this seemed to make sense. So it was kind of that two step. We started with, uh, we start so started from CNN that's just black box, and then we tried this regularization path analysis, and it was giving things, and it was there was some sense of robustness that you know each time we train, we seem to get the filters that sort of looked similar. But you know you cannot write a paper saying they sort of look similar, so um, and then we went back and just changed the architecture so that we have control over the nonlinearity, and that was satisfying for us, um, and we're kind of excited because uh, this allow it will allow us to look at many different types of this kind of image like data, although we applied it specifically for the quantum gas microscopy. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, any other questions? If not, um, let's thank Professor Kim again for coming and um, giving this talk for us. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.